Big Tim. Hi there, little Ryan. Hey. <laughs> See what I did there? Yep. That made me want to call you Tiny Tim. Oh, <laughs> you, you wouldn't be the first. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, what are we doing? You know what we're doing, Tim? No. <laughs> we are here for episode 81 of... Wait, That's right. really? Yes. Damn. That's right, folks. That's right, folks, fiends, and friends. You are here. We are here. Welcome to episode 81 of Dismembering Horror, the podcast show where myself, Ryan McDuffie, and And myself, Tim Aslan, we dismember a horror film every week, in fact. We talk about what worked for us, what did not work for us, anything we found interesting or noteworthy in our quest to be explorers and questers and searchers. For all that is horry and sight unseen, made seen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that. All that. <laughs> and uh, we venture to all sorts of territories, including occasionally dark waters. Oh, boy. <laughs> because explorers must traverse wet terrain. Because why not just arbitrarily pick two words and make a movie <laughs> you think they made based the movie on the title <laughs> or the title came first oh god not no, to be confused i think i think the movie came first and they're like what should we call it <laughs> who knows um well i guess the filmmakers yeah. but dark waters <laughs> yeah from 93 released originally in its country of origin italy and um as a co-production with with, with russia and 94 is the other release date listing, which I'm guessing is when it made it to the rest of the world. Yeah, So it, it's called Dark Waters, not to be confused with Dark Waters from last year, which I saw, which was with uh, Mark Ruffalo, the um, Todd Haynes movie, it was solid. And hmm. it's also not to be confused with a similarly titled Dark Water. Which has just one water. <laughs> yeah. Which is the there's the Jennifer Connolly movie that is a remake of a Japanese right. horror movie. Yeah. Where the ceiling is like turning black. Yeah. More scary dark water indeed. That one makes sense to me. <laughs> um <laughs> Well, I guess we'll get into why this one didn't make sense for you. Ugh. But before we do that, we gotta start with the trailer for Dark Waters. You ready? I'm so ready. All right, here it is from 93 slash 94, Dark Waters. I need to reach the convent tonight. Someone or something is trying to put the amulet together again. So, Tim, <clears throat> Mr. Tim, <laughs> yeah, Big Tim, Tiny Tim. Yep. Timothy Aslan. Aslan. Yep. What would you tell yourself per our rating system <sighs> to, well, how <laughs> to, to regard uh, your viewing habits in according with Dark Waters? Would you tell yourself to avoid it, stream it, rent it, or buy it? Oh my God. I am so close to an avoid. But I'll say stream because there's some cool design stuff in it here and there. <laughs> yep <laughs> kind of comes down to that i kind of have to give it a lower stream it as well i i, I rank this pretty s- similar but different as far as like how i rated trench 11 as the perfect like mm. fall asleep movie <laughs> after you're watching i had to i had in the middle of this i had to get up and go eat a cliff bar because i was like falling asleep <laughs> and, like blood sugar was just 
dropping into oblivion. But yeah, you know where you're with friends and maybe you watch <laughs> some other better horror movies and you don't want to call a night yet and mm. start passing out and you open your eyes occasionally to some cool imagery <laughs> yeah. and some some weird kind of uh, idiosyncratic moments yeah. that are fun but you don't necessarily feel like you have to pay attention to the story largely because there the isn't one. I'm sorry, the what? The story because there isn't I'm sorry, one. sorry, what? There Where is, you don't have to pay a attention to a story because there isn't one. Oh, there isn't one. Yeah. So, Weird, huh? So it, that's why it's perfect to fall asleep <laughs> to. And I, like in that circumstance or maybe like way <laughs> down the line, I could see myself watching it again. Or there's the part of me too that kind of like just was so bored with watching The Irishman and, like, everyone says it's a great movie. Like... <laughs> I didn't even bother. Like, where now that I know it's that kind of movie, I wonder if just seeing it again, like, I'll enjoy it more. Like, you know, and that's still maybe just the uh, the, the praise that I'm looking at in the film then. Oh, incredible atmosphere. Da, 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 da. You know, just all the sort of things that are cool about it. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if I'd just like it more for that. And I, I also... I just feel like pissed off in a way mm -hmm. because it's like, well, not pissed off. I just disappointed because you'd like you, when you have a bunch of cool kind of elements that don't coalesce into something cool. It's like, well, I mean, damn it. I'm sure this will probably this could be blasphemy for a, a lot of our listeners, but like exactly how you say that, that's how I felt about like all the Fulci and Argento movies we watch, except for opera. <laughs> like, yeah, the, I, I'll give those, they have kind of maybe more moments or just cool things to hang your hat on in the end. Mm -hmm. But it was, I was similarly just kind that's of fair. bored and confounded as like yeah. any of those that we've watched, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it looks like you were gonna say something. Else. I thought I was, but then that I didn't. All right. Well, then, how about we, <laughs> since we've given our ratings, we can move on to our summary. Um, I'll start with just from Shutter with there. I think that's Ooh, how I okay. discovered this movie was cool. you know listening on Shutter. So they describe the film as, and then as like we did last time, you could maybe expand on it. I'll do my best. So they say. When a young Englishwoman attempts to discover her mysterious connection to a remote island convent, she will unlock an unholy communion of torment, blasphemy, and graphic <clears throat> demonic depravity. Sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> what? I feel like it just never pays off, but... Yeah, that's pretty accurate. I mean... That's what they're going the for. Lovecraftian monster hidden behind Almost. a wall. I know, man, more of that. <laughs> well, but it's like I one of those that... things where it couldn't work if there was just simply more of it. Yeah, but I feel like we could have gotten some sort of glimmer of it along the way. Well, that could be more what worked, what didn't work. Yeah. How about um, what else? So I would say there's Paint sort a of a... There's more... To me, like, the big thing is this... Um, What's what's it called the the um oh my god what Hitchcock movies have these the 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 thing. MacGuffins? yeah the MacGuffin so there's sort of a MacGuffin with this like amulet I guess you could almost call it the mm -hmm. round thing with the demon face on it it's a stone amulet right and that thing gets broken into pieces and then it's like people the nuns I guess are trying to find all the pieces so that they can they can get the demon back through the portal to to earth or whatever and elizabeth is who grew up as a little girl on this uh, this convent island place her father had been donating to the convent right and so if she's deciding she wants to keep up the donations or whatever going she visits it as well as she has some sort of mystery to her past that she's trying to kind of piece together yeah, she can't remember anything from the time she lived on the island and we keep getting all these flashbacks and drawings and imagery of two little girls so mm -hmm. like we figure she's one of them we're trying, you know guessing who the other one is right and we've g been given the, i i guess ultimately a misdirect that the this girl who was still on the island like i, I guess presumably a nun or whatever, um, who is friends with Elizabeth, Teresa, 
has been writing letters saying like, you need to come visit or whatever, or wrote one letter. And so when Elizabeth gets there and Trace is not there, she's, it's sort of like, oh, well, what happened to her? A little, little bit of a solve the mystery of where she is. Um, but then it gets very convoluted in that the two little girls we keep seeing in flashbacks, there's another young woman who's about the same age as Elizabeth named Sarah, who is also a nun. A, a word we could coin that described this movie well, convent looted. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> I'm really into what you just did. Anyway, there's Sarah. Yeah. So then there's Sarah. And who's kind of like her, her point person for this weird, right. weird old comment. And all these nuns are there doing weird things. They're like, some of them are blind. Yeah. There's blind nuns. There is, they're whipping themselves. There's, there's all, a village. Yeah. There's a village. So, and then basically we just get more kind of glimpses and we weird kind of exchanges. Like the she gets attacked by a nun. Yeah. The whole movie is sort of her wandering around different, like, areas so we, there's like yeah, catacombs and then there's just like the actual convent and then there's the village and then it, there's like just outside and it, but much it's like, very wandry but we hardly get anything new no to keep no us going like story doesn't progress it's just sort of like oh here's this other weird character that's maybe some kind of right. clue to her past but not really right at one point we find out that there was a lie that her mother had died at childbirth. That that turns out to not be true because she finds in the village, she finds a woman who has pictures, I guess who is probably her nanny. And then anyway, sort. that all culminates into the, her mother. It, well, she's, she's sisters with this woman, Sarah, similar ages. And it turns out their mother is this Cthulhu, not Cthulhu, uh, Lovecraftian monster thing behind a wall hidden deep within the catacombs and the amulet is some is some part Put of a ritual together. yeah to to release her and they start doing it and then elizabeth backs out last minute and then movie's over and oh and then no she ends up being uh having the blind eye vision at the end because mm. once you see the demon i guess so you gotta be blind but you, you but then you have to see it forever Oh, in yeah. your mind's eye you're like from beyond those <laughs> eyes yeah okay yeah Great. that's the movie so it's it's all over the place yeah there's Our, a painter there's like an oracle painter guy yeah so that you got that going <laughs> all right let's figure out <laughs> what worked for us shall we yeah all right what worked what worked what worked for you what worked for you it worked like a charm smith <laughs> In a weird way, kind of similar to uh, The Devil's Doorway, there's a lot of what I would consider, you know, very cliched elements, but I like them all. Like, I like that there's a painter oracle guy. Well, yeah, from the beginning, it got me pretty into it. Like, in the, oh, yeah, I just love all this stuff ways. We had, we have, like, an ancient old book. We had amulets. Yeah. We had a seaside location. We had drawings of demons, the paintings, candlelit cave catacombs, beaches covered with dead fish. <laughs> like A fish guy who eats a fish yeah. raw. So He's all, just random dude. All of that, you know. <laughs> culminating into pretty cool atmosphere location mood you know all those words yeah but then nothing happens for an hour yeah at least right and this movie i think was just under like 87 minutes or something yeah it seemed so much i mean get sorry rid, this you, is what worked but you get rid of the credits and it's like 80 minutes anyway well so in 80 so, minutes so it, did the short running time work for us then as far as <laughs> at least it technically didn't take up more time is that our roundabout what worked here uh, mm, sure it's no, a bit confounding anyway but, no i, th I but I, yeah I, like you've got all these cool elements yeah i do um agree with a lot of like looking at you know letter box reviews and stuff with what people were praising about it mm -hmm. is the atmosphere yada yada the mood I think if you it, like, you can get on board with the with the meandering weirdness of things, 
or like, just not be bothered or right noted. There, there's yeah. a part of me that's like i'm digging that that like you you're kind of sitting there constantly going what the fuck is going on mm-hmm. um but it there's a threshold of, right. of almost tolerance so for that. So see, it's like, I liked it until I didn't like it. Yeah. I which could, is weird. I could see this um, spectrum of like movies doing that and how intentional and successful they're doing that. Where like audition is at the way top. Sure. And then like the middle one is angel heart. And then here's the lowest. <laughs> sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's interesting. Right. Well, yeah. So the thing that works about that is that you've got this dreaminess all the time and there are times when you know as the movie goes on you sort of stop knowing what's a dream and what's not and there's something pretty cool to me about that is this the uh what do you call that i i imagine there's sort of like a term for this style of you know you're kind of going down the spiral you know the dream spiral Well, where it's like reality is kind of falling away i guess and i like that as a concept a lot one thing that contributes to that in a maybe subtle way i don't know maybe not so subtle is just the sort of um uh uh ever present omnipresent threat of that that just you feel there Mm -hmm. with like the nuns it's like Mm -hmm. she can kind of be around them and talk to them and they'll kind of just say weird obtuse things but at the same time she's being attacked by them with like chains so it's this sort of like it's this <laughs> yeah. weird like there's this ongoing sense of like you aren't safe here but at the same time maybe you are she's like can kind of just yeah she, she can sleep there well know? and she's also just sort of left to her own devices right like mm-hmm. so there's this very strange well it, the effect that that has is like you're constantly wondering where she's at yeah. sort of like just as a per- as a character like is she okay are they purposefully like the mystery of of the world actually becomes like a character because you're sitting there going i don't like i don't know anything <laughs> yeah <laughs> and the the couple things we could hang our hat on as threads were at least even though it didn't give us like a lot to chew on or at least fun to just to kind of guess either way like suspecting sarah as yeah. is she good is she bad she's seems to be bad but yet she's also you know protecting um elizabeth from the nuns what is she i love i love that there's <laughs> there's like a quintessential moment where where sarah has essentially abandoned elizabeth when she said that she would like watch over her Mm -hmm. and then you know it kind of goes bad and then sarah shows up and and effectively saves elizabeth right right? and then they have like a little heart to heart (laughs) and elizabeth calls it out she's like uh i can't fucking trust you like you lied like how the fuck am i gonna trust you and sarah's response is like so stupidly good she's like well, but I saved you. Of course you can trust me. And it's like, well, no. Sarah, Say- like, Elizabeth is literally going, I cannot trust you in spite of the fact that you saved me because you fucking lied. That's like setting someone's house on fire and then saving them and then telling them, well, <laughs> yeah. I saved you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they kind of... They kind of just roll on through it. Mm-hmm. It's like you, everybody knows Sarah is not like trustworthy or a good person. We know that's coming. And the movie just goes, we're just fucking barrel through. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think what well, it is, it's sort of yeah. the hanging the lantern on it. It's like, well, let's just call it. I'd put it as not so much though. I don't know. I'll push back a little and say not so much like trustworthy as far as like, she's pure evil towards our hero. Right. Right. But, like she's got something she's not telling. Yeah. That's probably for her own personal motives. And then the mystery is to what extent that is actually yeah. harmful or not. Yeah. But I love the trope of, of course you can trust me. I did this thing for you. And we all know as movie watchers that yeah. that's like a signal. <laughs> <laughs> but like another though through line we had, which was nice, was the their, um, just seeing the flashbacks to the two little girls and knowing that there was a connection to the island with mm-hmm. Elizabeth as a little kid. At least, yeah. <laughs> It sort of tr- made it seem like there was maybe something going on. You know, it wasn't 
literally just as we put it, you know, she's wandering, even though it also is, you you have something, you know, I'm I'm looking for any anchors here that in themselves they were there were neat and fine. Yeah. It's very hard to pull <laughs> like logic. Yeah. You know, I think that's what in it, <laughs> That can be a cool thing, mm-hmm. but we, I think we, we were there and then we crossed over mm-hmm. in this one. So it's a, it, it's a little tough. Like there are things where I'm like the, the, uh, mystery or the, or, or the sort of suspicion of what the nuns are up to is cool. Yeah. I and, love and it's like the idea of following, like following them around and like making your way through this place down into the underbelly of it. And it's like all fucking ritually and cool. And they've got crosses that are burning and shit. And it's like a dead body. They carry a dead body. I like all that. I'm like, I'm into right, it. Cause what's more fun than nuns doing evil things, but like in their sort of fervent, like nun way, you know, <laughs> They're just unquestioning, yeah. devoted oh, yeah. way. It's so fun. And just like, okay, like all the nun stuff was great. You had, <laughs> this is a horror podcast, which is why I could have this as things that worked for me. Right. Nuns flogging themselves. Oh, yeah. This, nuns. That's called something. Ah, oh, damn, I forget. But it's like self-flagellation. Yeah. Um, viciously stabbing someone, Ooh, the woman. That like, stab repeatedly. is. Repeatedly. Over the top. Um, nuns attacking Elizabeth with a chain. You have <laughs> a nun set on fire running into the ocean. Oh, yeah. Un- That's the old lady. Oh, she's not a nun, though? No, she's a villager. Oh, okay. But the but the nuns... I thought they were all nuns. But the nuns <laughs> fucking just bust into her place and throw a burning cross, like, on her and light <laughs> the whole place on fire. Like, that is awesome and super intense. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, then we have reaching into the nun and like mm. pulling out. Was it a uh, guts? I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I, at first, I you think it, it was going to be a, some kind of weird fetus or yeah. something. But no, it was I this think kind it of just ended up being guts, gore guts. Because like there, she ends up eating it, the guts, and like that somehow is like part of the ritual to like release the demon. But this actually, I feel like delivered more of what we were wanting from the devil's doorway of just no, getting yeah. to watch more specifics of crazy evil nuns doing things. Yeah. Yeah. If you could kind of combine those two movies, you might have something. <laughs> yeah. You're right. Um, you're right. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Like there's, that if cave you could have led yeah. anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's an interesting, I, it, <laughs> I wondered a few times during this, like, if this movie had influenced modern like filmmakers, um, it seems to have its fans. Yeah, I can't remember. Fuck, I forget what there was a specific movie that popped into my head. I was like, "Ooh, um, this feels like it was taken or they took from this." Anyway, anyway. they're just. I guess if we're on to more specific things, I liked. Um, there was the. The guy acting like Golem, eating right. the fish. You know, I just made me so happy. I was clapping. <laughs> just, blah, blah, just like on her boat ride there. Yeah. There's this weird little like Italian dude with shirtless eating a fish. I'll tell you what. The, all of the weird characters are cool. Mm-hmm. Like it's fun. The bus ride characters. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? The guy who's like chopping up a body in his little like yeah. beach cabin. Who then, like, is sort of wiping the blood off on his chest. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the blind, like, Mother Superior. Oh, my God. I with love... her weird communication yeah, thing. She... Like, yeah, like, she said, uh, no, it was grudge-like. She was going, I don't... Oh, that's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I love that. Yeah. I loved um, when we finally, of course, do get to the monster at the end. That design is cool. The, yeah, the mother monster and just the conceit is good of like, you know, sort of built in way of you want to show it without showing it uh-huh. and just having it literally be behind a wall with just some holes was yeah. just a sort of very... There's, there's like one shot 
where Sarah, right at the end, where Sarah is sort of kneeling in front of the monster and then monster is suddenly like just in shadow. Mm -hmm. And it is fucking cool looking. Mm -hmm. Like you're just getting enough light on like the, uh, the sort of ripples of the monster that you're, it's very cool. It's almost alien-esque, you know, like it's the sort of the big, well, I guess it would be aliens, the second one. The big, you know, whatever you the call queen. It, queen. Yeah, it sort of feels like that, that if it were to come out of the shadow, you would see this, like, huge thing. And I think part of that's because of the suggestion of how big it is when we see it through the wall. It's also bulbous. But yeah, man, it is a cool fucking design. So I, I'm, yeah. I and was then, so say what disappointed me about it, but I won't. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so Elizabeth and Sarah, you know, we learn their their sisters, and this monster is their mother. We get the reveal of Sarah is actually part monster physically. Right. We see her. She's. Uh, I feel like somewhere between Cronenberg and Lovecraft is kind yeah. of how she looks. She's yeah. got the six breasts. It kind of looks all the skin's just kind of monstered oh, yeah, up pitted and weird and <laughs> yeah gruesome. Except, so everything except for her face i thought that was a cool Which just fun reveal made me think of martyrs the like everything but her face at the end of martyrs <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's the same shit no but i love that reveal and if you're into it that you know be it's creepy yeah yeah um i think the last kind of like more this is what i, I don't know i want to say technical but um overall thing the score i was actually pretty into for me it had that good balance where it had like actual you know a um a tune it was you know musicality but then also what is what i love especially in horror soundtracks is just these kind of combined with that unnerving like more intonations and mm. sounds and drones and things that are sort of discordant and yeah. not with a tempo it was just it sort oh. of was like the best of both worlds for me as far as that soundtrack that's doing both those things this reminds me of, of here's a very cool example of a composer really picking a thing that makes us feel uncomfortable so at a certain point they're down in the catacombs and shit sort of going going bad and i think it's right before the sarah revealed and and the mother monster reveal and the beat the the actual rhythmic beat of the score is in a very unnatural time signature it's in 15 8 time right so most stuff is is in fours Right. Uh, all music that we kind of traditionally feel that we know Western music is always pretty much in four, you know, divided by fours. And so to be in 15 time, 15, eight time is you can look at it two ways, but ev they even went further from like you hear this in some rock music. You'll hear like seven, eight. So seven beats for, per eight beats um, in a measure. And then alternating that with eight and eight. So it's a, it's a weird thing, but it's kind of cool. Like you can make it work. This isn't even doing that. It's literally just going 15 beats in a row and repeating. So it's actually in fives, which makes us feel weird because it's it, it's pushing us off of Isn't our that beat. Classic, like the Halloween's and theme is in or exorcist and or exorcist theme are both that five, four time. I think that's right. Yeah. Um, so it worked for you in setting. Yeah, it's. I just sat there going, "Whoa, the <laughs> fucking who does that? That's cool as hell." Cool. So yeah, I, music. I, I yeah, music's fun. Any other moments that you just got a shout out? Um, the de the design of the. I guess it's a nun, right? Yeah, it's sort of a nun, but I think I think it's a dude actually on the cross in in nun costume with it's a flashback of the two girls going down in the catacombs and the a nun on a cross like crucified nun starts to float forward and that the face is you know has a prosthetic on it and like its mouth is agape and whatever but it has no eyes like it's got makeup over the eyes like it's just blank eyed like skin, not eye, no, no eyeballs. No, no, yeah, no. I was going to mention that too. Love that. I love that. That was probably the standout visual for the yeah. film. No, and specifically, what you're saying it means it's not just that the, the crucified nun 
floating down the hall with the little girls in front of it has no eyes. It's that she has no sockets. Yes. Yes, exactly. They're just, it's just skin. skin. It's so cool um, looking. Yeah. That, that was maybe the highlight I of know. the whole movie for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, just talk about, you know, the imagery that might stick with someone and get them excited. And I get where they're kind of coming from thematically. There's this whole motif of like, once you see it, you can't unsee it and, you know, good and evil and blah, blah, blah. If you choose to go down this pathway of, of you know, trying to let evil in, there's a cost, right? Like you can't see the, you can know, you're no longer allowed to see the world around you. you. You now are blind to that and have to only see the image of the demon or Satan or whatever the fuck. Yeah. And that's like, that's kind of a cool cursy you know concept thing theme um when listing just wonderful use of things happening to and with nuns the nun that came after her with the chain it led to a battle with her falling out of like a belfry tower or something <laughs> yeah that was cool <laughs> yeah oh and you know it's the same thing as evil dead and but the crawling you know first person camera you know, oh, yeah. d- you know, force is always fun. Yeah. It'd get happening at and two nuns. Had like the exact same sound as mm-hmm. the Evil Dead one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so whatever. It's the same demon, maybe. I don't know. Enjoyed this maybe um, more than I would have just coming off of just really wanting some good nun whore after being disappointed with the devil's doorway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, anything else or should we move on? No. We should move on. All right. What did not work? It's not ready yet. Seems to work okay. No, something important's missing. What did not work? <laughs> All right. So I had sort of a realization, speaking of nun horror, and it and it's kind of souring me to this genre. And basically what it is, if you sort of look at it from a certain perspective, this trope of nuns being bad secretively and like worshiping Satan and whatever, it's now just kind of leaving a bad taste in my mouth because we're, well, granted, um, Devil's Doorway was made by a woman, but there's this sort of like, it just feels bad to me that we're, we're perpetuating this idea of like (laughs) women who are supposedly you know pious or whatever are actually bad and it just feels like there's like an undercurrent of criticizing women and like i don't know it just feels i mean feels kind of gross to me permission to speak freely but it's like I f- for me, it, that's how it makes me feel. It strikes me more as like, um, it, you know, when you look at patriarchal versus versus feminine and just the the church in the bad ways as an institution is pure, bad, pra- patriarchal, like in its right. unhealthy extreme. So it just kind of feels more horrific in the context of this stuff happening to this woman, yeah. not so much as putting blame on them, but just another way of just like how they're being yeah kept and put down right i i i agree mm-hmm. i feel that i think the thing i was sort of just surfacely responding to is that why aren't there movies about priests being the evil ones mm-hmm. because well it, it news feel, flash right. everybody <laughs> There's a lot of fucked up priests out it, there. They you know, did, that's a thing. I will say, like, in both these films, it felt, like, really lacking to have the sort of one central priest, like, right. just character. So that's kind of some other, you know, yeah. side of the equation. You that's know? kind of what I think I'm responding to, where I'm just kind of, like, it feels a little bit like we're dodging a reality you want, and not pointing at the fact that if you want to really fucking point at the church, like... You can show the evils of what men do within the church as a metaphor for the evils that men do in the church. You're you're over pure 
uh, nun exploitation horror. You want some Catholic exploitation. I do. I do because fuck them. Yeah. Like fuck the people who like protected that. Like I'm talking about like the child molestation and stuff and like all of that. Like people protected that. The institution protected that. And like in a weird way, having mo- movies that focus on the women in that context as the like bad guys is now I've like hit my limit. Well, I'm, I'm annoyed. Totally. With it. Totally. It's hard, though, at least for these two movies story wise, because it's all about being like literally at convents where literally it's supposed to be just nuns and women. Right. And I think that that trope, it feels like in a weird way, exploitative and a dodge away from some of the actual evils that we see in institutions. Right. But it just seems to speak more to like... um, availability of movies versus you can't you you these movies just wouldn't exist if you took out because they they rely on being set at these locations right well and i think yeah it's sort of just speaking to a broader thing that that convent thing is a thing and, Mm -hmm. and and like let's use that thing that exists or whatever as our framework so yeah so anyway that's a long way around to i'm over it your your frame of just wanting another kind affected being affected your ability to be able to tune into this yeah. kind even though yeah. they're just separate in a way it's sort of similar to how i feel about the final girl trope you know where i'm like if we're going to keep doing that in modern context like we need to adjust the trope appropriately to speak to these other things well, and get away from the like traditional final with girl thing. That it's interesting because you know how this like horror movies move in cycles. You have the originators, you have the sequels, then you have mm-hmm. the spoofs and the self awares, right, right, and then it right. repeats itself. Yeah. It's I feel like we finally like I feel like the final girl thing kind of was a sort of like lingering sort of chunk that you know started and did a little later where mm-hmm. now we have had a movie literally called final girls i feel <laughs> right. like most movies yeah. are you know take the self-aware approach so now yeah. i feel like we've come full back around where it's just sort of like hopefully we're just at a place where it can be like you know what just do what feels best mm-hmm. and don't and hopefully you aren't getting caught up at all right. in these old like yeah. 70s 80s 90s tropes 2000s 2010s Ooh. tropes anymore <laughs> of final girls we've called right. a spade a spade right now just do it without that lens at all and y- yeah and i mean i think in terms of the nun stuff you actually have I start, sorry, I says eight, sorry, just to, because these are tricky things clarified. You can do it with the lens, of course, but just don't do it with thinking that that's how you're supposed to. That's what right. I mean. <laughs> right. Well, and I think, sorry, a, well, yeah, a good example of the nun exploitation, let's call it, trope is a modern movie that we just watched with, with The Devil's Doorway, where it is actually pointing at the horrors of the institution of you know these what were they called the laundries the something laundries um and that so that i think is pushing in the magdalene laundry yeah we're pushing in the right direction to sort of like use horror as the framework to sort of shine a light on the like the real horrors of the world in a you know potentially fun and whatever poignant way uh obviously this movie dark waters was 25 years earlier so you know it's doing its own thing but the blumhouse uh what's his name um the the all the nun the, the nun right which is a spin-off of the insidious yeah right is it mm-hmm. insidious yeah it's like, all the same uh conjuring averse sure right that <laughs> that whole thing that now feels like the wrong direction to be taking this type of trope you know, so that's like the other end of the spectrum in, now. A, in a modern, t- yeah, today. <laughs> How about then? Doing <laughs> that, that thing feels wrong I to mean, me. And I those mean, movies just, me- they, it's like, wh- I, I mean, I guess I was being sarcastic. Like I was over them when they came out, not just now. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, very much so. But in, you know, in our modern context, we're, we, you know, you have some people who I think are doing the, the 
they're perpetuating the thing that I'm complaining about. And then you have some people who are trying to take these old tropes and modernize and like actually speak to a thing. Um, and that's a big, you know, that's a big uh, spectrum. Yeah. I'm not saying you, you shouldn't have those movies, but I don't like those, so you know. The Devil's Doorways may be a more transitional yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. And I, in a direction that I'm, is way more appealing to me. Let's put it that way. Mm-hmm. So anyway, that's my, whatever you want to call that. Oh, an aspect of why Dark Waters from 1993 didn't work for you. <laughs> yes, very much got so. It. It, well, it just got me thinking about it. Yeah. You know, where I was like, dude. I mean, like I said in the, um, <laughs> like I said in our ratings at the beginning, it's, I can't help that I was just bored during most of it. Cause, like, Well, because nothing happens. Right. Like, even though... I can, you know, and I'm usually the one between us who's more forgiving of mystery and story elements is sort of lacking or not adding up Mm -hmm. and just being okay with that when the exchange is good atmosphere or tension or things like that. It just also just needed more things to happen at all. The, I think one of the main, sorry, I just, I hate how that sounds just as like, it makes me sound like if you're someone who needs a jump scare every 10 minutes, this may not be for you. I think there's a, I think there is a specific one of maybe a many specific reasons that we felt this way. And I think it boils down to, I think we talked about this very recently. I'm not sure. Maybe it was Angel Heart. Um, The, you need something to hang your hat on as a, as a, person emotionally and generally speaking that's our protagonist and so we need to be on board with them we need to sort of feel we need to go through what they're going through and like you know connect to them and if that protagonist doesn't have any reactions to anything right they're just blank the whole time in the face of a bunch of shit happening we can't hang on to anything because you can have the question just be as open as what's going to happen but you're right it does come down i'm I'm just thinking of like yeah what's why am i into the witch and not this you know (laughs) because you can get on board with the emotional state and the fucking because the character in the witch is is trying to figure it out and having a fucking experience. Whereas Elizabeth is kind of trying to figure it out, but she's not having an experience that we connect to at all. We, ne- I never once felt like, oh shit, right? It just kind she's of. She's just, dude, in, she's defying like normal reaction. She walked into a villager's fucking shack, and he is actively cutting up a human body and she sees it and she just carries on like whatever yeah, i literally was you. like are we not gonna fucking talk about the dead body in the other room that this guy is chopping up then, she just was like oh can i see the letters that like maybe my friend sent oh cool <laughs> cool 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 i'm gonna take this one all right um yeah anyway have a good one yeah. see ya what the fuck? I just, it's just so confounding to me that there's a bunch of those moments, right? Like a nun fucking put a chain around her neck and tried to kill her and she slept there that night. Yeah, I was going to say. What the fuck are we doing? That, like that at a certain point, I'm, I'm, I'm out. Like I'm not on board with this person because she's not doing things that make any fucking sense. That's, she doesn't even have an opinion. That's my, uh, that's my memory of this movie. It feels like. She walks around crazy, inexplicable, horrible stuff that often is immediately threatening to her happens. And then she goes to bed and then we repeat. (laughs) Yeah. And sometimes it's a dream and sometimes it's not. And then the like one time that she actually seems like she's like, I'm going to what the fuck, dude? I just saw a dead body like the nuns are carrying a dead body. That's probably my friend. Sarah comes along and she's like, no, 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 no. Well, you know, whatever. I'm still on your side. It's cool. (laughs) And she's like, all right. Yeah. All right. Fuck off. All right. I guess I'll just keep hanging out. I mean, she's kind of just, it feels like she's just sort of staying there as if she's at like a bed and breakfast. It doesn't feel <laughs> like she's on some quest to discover her past or yeah, whatever. Or like is freaked out. Yeah. <laughs> like, like I, here's a really simple thing. You, this would make me go, okay, I'm on board with this character having a little bit of fucking personality and logic. Uh, just show her locking the door. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just show her going up to being like, take a fucking deep breath. Wow, shit's fucking weird. 
I ain't fucking, I better lock the door because it's getting weird. <laughs> yeah. Just do that. And I'd be like, well, at least she's fucking, you know, a, like <laughs> having a little bit of caution. I knew you were done. She had none. She just sort of was like, well, back to bed. Great. What the fuck, dude? I was, I was hoping you'd be able to put kind of like, <laughs> you know, pinpoint exactly what it was and not disappointed. Jesus. Um, like, there's a moment <laughs> when she has followed the nuns. And she's on the little catwalk that's overlooking the painter's den or whatever you want to call it, the the oracle painter den. And she, oh yeah, and she she fucking falls like it's the ricketiest of fucking like catwalks. And she and she like leans against the the railing, and of course it breaks away, right? And she kind of catches herself, and then she takes a few more steps and falls through the the catwalk onto the ground. And then this blind painter guy is like reaching out for her and like, ah, rah, 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 rah. and she just stands there, right? She sort of slowly backs up. Why wouldn't you fuck? It's the guy's blind. Fucking run to the door and check all the doors. <laughs> like, see if you can get out of there <laughs> and make it like, make us care. Right. We. She just stood there like, uh. The guy's blind. <laughs> it just was like, yeah. you can't get on board with a character who just doesn't fucking do anything logical. It's it's annoying. Mm -hmm. Like, at least in Angel Heart, as meandering as that was at times, I was so on board with him because he's constantly going, what the fuck, dude? Mm -hmm. Just having him say what the fuck is going on makes me go, yeah, what <laughs> is going on? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. with you, dude. This is weird. <laughs> Her, I'm like, I. do you care? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. If you don't care, I don't care. Well, also, if this was sort of hanging on just us being able to follow. She, I'm sorry. She, the fucking, she goes to the village and there is a woman there and she discovers that her mom was not dead at childbirth uh, when she was born that she continued to live there's a picture of her and her mom when she's seven she's like what the fuck what a big lie all blah. and the lady just sort of sitting there being like ah, ah, ah. and then the nuns run in and throw fucking burning's crosses into that house and light the house on fire and she looks at the old lady and goes peace the fuck out and runs out of the thing like help and then the lady burns to death like help her out <laughs> right what the fuck her caretaker from when she was a kid. Yeah, like, grab the old lady and get the fuck out of there. <laughs> no, she's just like, oh, see you later. Yep. And then she's upset when the, the old lady comes out and is burning to death. Yep. No. It makes me fucking, di like, I don't want to hate the main character. This is what you said. Demon Wind actually had more character logic for you. <laughs> Whoa, that's bad. <laughs> yeah. If that's true, that is fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to say, uh, even on top of all that, on a, if, if we were just, if it was important to be able to follow any kind of story elements or like me saying at the beginning that she was there to like follow her father's donation, that was only from reading the Wikipedia. I knew that. And it's because <laughs> in a tech, like this movie definitely looked cool and you could tell it was like, you know, shot when it was shot. But I swear their sound gear sounded like it was from 1955. I could only... It might have been. I could only <laughs> understand what the two the two leads, Elizabeth and Sarah, were saying. And I'd say 80% of Sarah's dialogue is, is 80 yard. Well, like 80% of what anyone else said, which is so much of the um, exposition. Yeah. I just literally couldn't like understand. Oh, yeah. Both the sailor guys, I couldn't understand a word they said. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, are they speaking Italian? Right. Oh, I, 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 <laughs> the devil wouldn't mercy. It was, yeah, I agree. It just was like, what the fuck are we doing? Yeah. It's annoying because, like I said, I there's a bunch of elements that are cool. But, like, if they, if they don't add up to something... Or you, or you spend the majority of the movie going, what the fuck just happened? Or what are they saying? Or like, what, wh why are we here? How did we get here? I mean, even just the confusing aspect of like where she is, like from moment to moment, 
they do a thing which I thought I was like, oh, this is a dream thing. But it's like, it's a little too confusing. She's like, she a few times walks out of her bedroom into a hallway and we're in like a, I guess, sort of a stone, not modern, but it's a, it's a stone hallway. It's like a church hallway. And she's looking down the hallway and then we flash to what you would assume is what she's looking at. And it's the catacombs as if they're in front of her, but they're not. She's in a hallway. And so there's just just this like it's just too confusing for the viewer to piece together what the fuck is actually going on. Is that a vision in her head? Like you, there's too little to kind of grab onto at these moments of of like I think they're trying to be stylistic and make it feel you know, off kilter or whatever, but like, you got to do something to define that methodology so that we know what the fuck is going on. Cause I, I spent probably the last half of the movie being like, what, it, what is happening? Mm -hmm. How did we get here? Are we here? Is it a dream or is it like, what's the, like some thread to mm -hmm. hang on to? It just doesn't exist. That's, I mean, what didn't work for me, maybe it's for us to let me know, but it just seems like it comes down to those generalities, which are, you know, glaring, but I can't, I, I don't have anything else. It's like those, those are them. Yeah. Yeah. Oh man. There was a continuity thing that pissed me off. Now I don't even remember what it was. I think it pissed me off so much. I was like, I don't want to think about this. Should we move on then? Things of note? Um... Oh, no, I have one more. The <laughs> the look the look and sort of tonality of the movie 90% of the time is quite cool. You know, I dig it. It looks it looks good. It's on film. It like it's got some grit to it. The color palette is cool. And then suddenly they flash like three times to an image of Elizabeth as a little girl, like with blood on her. And it's this desaturated near black and white, but the red is pumped up. Very nineties music video thing. And I just, it was, it was infuriating. Right, to when me. that shot came up in the trailer, you just laughed just now. Yeah. Later. I'm just like, no, no way. <laughs> you're, you're doing a like on an Island convent, like fucking creepy thing. And you threw in this weird, modern stylized, like weird coloring image. Like stop it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Don't get cute. I agree. <laughs> Things of note. Yeah. This should be interesting. I mean, just on Wikipedia, who knows where they got this? And it's it's <laughs> appropriately Wikipedia kind of, you know, uncertain. But interesting nonetheless. Perhaps the first Western film to be shot in Ukraine following the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and as we mentioned, it's an Italian-Russian co-production. Hmm. Um... The, um, I was, you know, I was, I was doing some Googling. If we had had the, uh, the, we watched on Amazon Prime, it's also available on Shutter. but there is like a DVD, maybe a Blu-ray set, but there are hmm. special features out there that offer a lot, but I was able to find some stuff. It was apparently a very, very difficult shoot. Did you come across that at all? Uh, only in the trying to get it off the ground dealing with the politics around that. Mm. Like there's a coup in uh, Moscow while they're trying to finance it. And so it was just like a fucking mess. Right. And headache. <laughs> this is, um, so this is from, there's a book called Twisted Visions, Interviews with Cult Horror Filmmakers. And then the filmmaker of this film, who we haven't mentioned his name, Mariano Baino, Baino, <laughs> something like that. Baino. Baino, apologies. Um, he says... It's probably just Baino. Baino. 
<laughs> I could fill a book with all the problems that plagued our production. Mark Kermode in his excellent book, It's Only Movie, dedicated a whole chapter about 60 pages long to his visit to the set of Dark Waters and to all the weirdness he witnessed. Hmm. And he was only there for a few days. Ooh. So he wrote 60 pages on all the weird stuff going wrong and was only oh, there no. for three days of the shoot. If anyone is interested, they should pick up his book, then watch the one hour documentary Deep Into Dark Waters. Cool. Included on the No Shame special edition release of Dark Waters and on the new French release by the XC of Film. And finally, listen to the audio commentary on the same discs. And even all that couldn't cover but a small part of the whole story. Interesting. Yeah. You know, it makes me... The the only other thing that I... I don't know why this... You saying that made me think of this, but it made me think of the dude in the beginning, the priest in the beginning, who like walks in and the church starts to basically leak from the storm outside, the dark waters that are coming. And then, like, the door blows open, and that guy gets pierced with the, like, the tip of the crucifix and, and dies. Um, maybe my read on this in terms of, like, patriarchy and whatever is totally wrong. Like, because of the like mother demon sort of I don't know what you metaphor, maybe this movie is is somehow pointing at like breaking down the patriarchy and being like, I don't know. I'm 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 really kind Mama's of like mad. Spinning. Yes. Yes. In a way, it's like when you when you perpetuate this sort of shitty patriarchy the, that the you know unfortunately the church often represents not not on purpose necessarily but just does and this movie is sort of like that was the last dude on the island right and and this force the the retributional force took over and said fuck that and now this is what the yeah the women are sort of trying to unleash the power that they haven't had onto the world. Because from the nun's perspective, they're honestly, actually from any perspective, they, you know, we say, oh, it's crazy what they're doing. They're trying to kill her, but they're trying to stop the release of this demon monster. Like that's why they're going after Elizabeth. You know, they aren't necessarily the bad guys. It was a really hard thing to wrap my head around to figure out what the nun's like purpose and and like angle was like what were they trying to do because at times it seemed like they were trying to collect all of the pieces of the amulet to so that they would have them and have that power but i think it's the reverse what you're saying right like that they were trying to separate all of the pieces so that you couldn't their whole that power. i feel like they're the the gatekeepers their whole duty is to keep this monster at bay yeah so, yeah, it's... Which is what her then Elizabeth's father was donating money for. Right. And telling her not to go there mm-hmm. for. So, yeah, I mean, it's it's in there. Like, there's some cool shit almost in there, but it just doesn't pay off. So, um, yeah, that's so, sort of no, <laughs> noteworthy, I guess. After setting up, you know, stuff was going wrong, what I just said mm-hmm. on the shoot, um, I found some examples just to sort of help oh, a cool. picture of curiosity from... DreadCentral.com's DVD review when they actually talk about the documentary Deep Into Dark Waters. They said, principals including Baino, lead actress Saltir, and various crew members recount tales of hardship regarding filming in Ukraine and Kiev. Highlights or lowlights include arriving on location via 24-hour bus ride, finding out no cameras had arrived, a oh, lethargic no. Russian crew that took three-hour lunches, finding out their sets had been sold by their own production manager, Uh, various stories about vodka and discovering their huge monster was lost in the mail. Oh, no. Bino being literally in the middle of a military revolution while finishing post-production. Holy shit. Yeah. That, I want to watch that. Right? I know, we should have gotten the DVD. Fuck. So... Also from that uh, that book, Twisted Visions, Interviews with Cult Horror Filmmakers, um, one other quote, I thought it was a fun thing of note, tidbit about this movie, something we didn't mention, but I could mention that worked, was the soundscape, you know, it just is part mm-hmm. of the atmosphere. 
So the question, your creative and haunting sound design gives the film an unnerving quality that gets under the viewer's skin. How can you reveal how you achieved this? I always wanted to layer the sound and include a lot of animal sounds, which was not obvious to me. But he said, I thought it was important to complement the music by adding an unsettling soundscape, which would not be too intrusive, but would definitely be noticeable. Some sounds I wanted to keep almost subliminal. We did the sound post in Moscow. Most of it was done the old fashioned way, listening to thousands of reel to reel tapes to find the right sound. Among the many sounds used, we used the sound of bear cubs crying, <laughs> which seemed extremely haunting to me, layered with some tiger sounds, the sound of a Japanese tsunami, a particularly <laughs> noisy donkey, and even the sound of hundreds of sirens announcing the death of Brezhnev. Jesus. Last ones, admittedly, lost on me, but colorful. Wow. <laughs> Nonetheless. Yeah, um, that's cool. And then from that DVD review, too, I also found out uh, that the, the special edition DVD is pretty cool. It comes with a miniature replica of that stone amulet, <laughs> and it's made from actual stone. Ooh. Heavy, yeah. Wow. Great. Well, there you have it. Dark Waters 1993, not 2019. <laughs> even, even though on Amazon Prime, it is both listed as 93 or 94 and 2019. Like, But there also is another 2019 I, exactly. movie, Dark Waters, which I saw, the Mark I know, I'm one. so confused. I think it was just maybe like sometimes... Like remastered it, or something? Yeah, yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> and it was also as a 94 release date because of its international release. Ah! Too much is too much. So then should we move on from Dark Waters well, into so. our recommendations? Well, yeah. You mean like... Get out of these dark waters. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have anything? My recommendation is called Hellier. And it is... <laughs> I walked in on Tim watching this the other day. It is so in my fucking wheelhouse. I love it so much. Even though it is absolute bullshit, nutso shit. But... <laughs> Okay, so Tim's a devout fan of ghost adventures. Yes, so for context, basically, how do I describe it? You got to just watch it. It's so fucking fun. It's a it's a documentary series that a few different paranormal researchy type dudes and and girls g got together because <laughs> one of them started getting emails from some random guy saying. I need your help because there are these little humanoid goblin type beings that are coming out of the mines and caves of the Kentucky mountains that surround me and sold. Right. And like, can you come investigate and help out? And then the email correspondence just abruptly stops. And so through a series of events, this group of people kind of converge and they keep using the term synchronicity, uh, which gets a little annoying, but bear bear with it. And so they start trying to track this guy down and go. they go to the town of Hellier to like figure out if there's anything there. And it just becomes this crazy cascade of weird shit. And they're like investigating, right? But like it goes from like we're investigating some guy's emails of like goblins into like the fucking deep deep lore of like the mothman prof prophecies and like alien abduction and cryptozoology and like it just goes on and on into the there's like some guy that that supposedly existed named uh in Indris in Indrid Cold, who I'd never heard of. And they I mean these guys are so deep in this like para paranormal land. Like they have books upon books upon books on this shit. I mean Tim, if is, we had another life to lead, that would be dude, us. We it would is, be those people. It's amazing. And like the esoteric shit that goes on, like at one point they're getting into like um uh, what's his name? The fucking the the oh god the Crowley the fucking Alistair Crowley. Alistair Crowley shit. I love that stuff. 
and like it's uh, they're finding connections which i think is fun because you're watching people who who have this like large knowledge base of all of this shit and they're like they're literally doing the like red th- red uh yarn maps and connecting shit like no no joke they actually do that yes. at one point yes. and i'm like this is my kind of shit <laughs> They do numerology stuff, which is just bat shit in my mind. Like they're like, they're like, see this fucking this number that that was on the letter that the guy sent, and it's like a fifty fucking digit number. And they're like, well, we started playing around with those numbers, and everything adds up to either threes or nines. And ninety three in this like occult book represents this phrase, and this phrase, you know, is also associated with the number four one eight. And ninety three and four one eight are on the tribunal of this book that this guy wrote and that guy knew this guy and this guy you know is the guy who said this one quote which is quoted in the email that the original guy sent and it's just it's all connected i can just see you just like mind bending like i can just see you just grinning like an idiot just yes lapping it up yeah yeah but i I, honestly you have me sold this sounds so cool (laughs) they also do some cool experiments that like if they're not Hoaxers this sounds more up my alley because hell. like ghost adventures i don't know it just always felt limited to the story yes. of the paranormal yeah. thing they could well, tell each time that's right because yeah they're trying to squeeze it into this episode yeah but this is not that this is like let's just let the fucking dominoes continue to fall <laughs> <laughs> is it two seasons yeah so two seasons <laughs> five of course well only five episodes per season so there are 10 episodes Still. right now and well, each episode is probably an hour ish. That's huge. It's it's a yeah, it's a lot of content. I mean, it's you, so fun. Dude. At face value, you think this is just going to be you know it'd be a documentary, like yeah. an episode, but two seasons. Oh yeah. All right. Well, I'll leave my recommendation short because I just haven't been watching a lot. But something I did watch, I liked. I'd never really been fans of those Lonely Island dudes, but watched their film Pop Star, Never Stop, Never Stopping. I I had myself a ball. What that is? (laughs) A really fun spoof critique, all that on you know something, but it's like more if you know because I love Naked Gun and those kinds of movies, Mm -hmm. just silly, like smart, stupid, yeah, kind of thing. But just some parts just to had me on the floor, Tim. It was (laughs) so refreshing. Um, Cool. And then that title alone, if you know me, probably you know it was a good indicator. I'd like it. Pop star, never stop, never stopping. <laughs> awesome. All right, I'm handing you the hat, Tim. Oh, I can't wait. There's so few in there. Yeah. I think there's four. So what's next? Okay, of these four, I'm grabbing this one. Alice, sweet Alice. Oh, okay. I know it's an older one. It is. I've been wanting to see this for a long, long time and just never have. So. 1976. Cool. Great. I'm into it. Cool. Oh, with uh, Brooke Shields. All right. Great. Well, until next week for Alice Sweet Alice, you could find us at dismemberinghorror.com, our Instagram at dismemberinghorror. You can email us at dismemberinghorror at gmail.gov. You should check that email. Oh, no, dot com. Sorry. <laughs> dot com, dot com. <laughs> you should check that email right now, Tim. Oh, should I? I mean, if we're telling people to email us, I think we better check it. <laughs> so you hear that? We're checking it now. And our big ask, if you enjoyed the show, is to, well, our big ask that we know we're, you're not going to do is to leave a, a five-star review on iTunes. That really helps. But since we know you probably aren't going to do that, we ask you to tell a like-minded friend who may enjoy the show about a show whenever you may be happen, happen to be speaking to them. <laughs> Can yeah. re- recommend recommend our show <laughs> yeah anyways you know it's you know it's also funny on our email we get a lot of like hey would you be interested in this somebody who's like do you want horror.info the domain for only 250 dollars <laughs> no no <laughs> well, we agree we agree there no we have our we have a website. It's, we already said and it's awesome. Dismemberinghorror.com, not yeah. dismemberinghorror.info. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, great. So in closing, thank you so much for listening. Yes, and we will see you next time. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.